Now we know that IPsec is critical for creating these virtual private network connections, but what other types of protocols are we going to be utilizing in a wide area network environment? Well, certainly one of those is PPP. As a matter of fact, a lot of jokes uh, around networking often will say that this is the planet's most popular protocol. One of the reasons why this joke exists is the fact that with PPP, we can go ahead and encapsulate data over a leased line. This is where we're real stingy, where we don't want to share the WAN connection with anyone and we go ahead and we encapsulate the data with PPP and send it over a private circuit that we're leasing from an internet service provider. If we want to save some money and still be able to do this effectively, we can utilize Frame Relay, where the telco service provider is making the equipment shared amongst a bunch of customers, and they'll give us a discount in the price. Frame Relay would be an alternate technology to PPP, and we'll have a chapter here dealing with it shortly. Notice in a circuit switch type of WAN environment, we would do PPP, and this would be sending the data encapsulated with PPP over the public telephone system as one way to do our WAN networking. And now, lately, we have a technology called Metro Ethernet that's exciting, where we take our Ethernet packets and send them into the service provider, and they send them to the next destination at a real high rate of speed. Finally, there's broadband options for our wide area networking that we have to recognize. These are things like DSL and cable high-speed options that can go to homes or to branch offices, for example. Now, PPP, the planet's most popular protocol, one of the reasons it got a lot of press early on is the fact that it can work with more than just TCP IP. The old Apple Talk could be used with PPP. The old IPSXPX could be used with PPP. But those protocols certainly have fallen out of favor, and we don't see those anymore. We just see our TCP IP in use. But the neat thing is about the point-to-point -point protocol is that while it's going to be really just used with our IP these days, it does bring a lot of features to the table. One of the features that I'll be demonstrating is authentication. That's right, that great authentication capability that Ed Yanez was teaching us about, that functionality is built right in to the point-to-point -point protocol, and we'll see how we're going to take advantage of it coming up. Here to talk to us more about PPP and how it functions is our own guest expert, Mike Vasquez. P-cubed. I've never heard it called that. We could start something new, or maybe stick to convention, point-to-point -point protocol. It can provide authentication, encryption, and compression, but first, Let's take a closer look at session establishment for this data link protocol, which happens in up to three phases. The first phase is the link establishment phase and relies on LCP packets to get the job done. The packets that are exchanged contain configuration options and the nodes will negotiate to determine settings such as the MRU, compression, and the link authentication protocol PAP or CHAP. Unspecified options are set to the option default. The next phase, authentication, is optional dependent on your configuration. You'll select an authentication protocol. These most often end with AP authentication protocol, so they're easily recognizable. Now, do they encrypt all traffic? No, they are simply a means to verify passwords. PAP, password authentication protocol, is typically the choice to avoid because it passes passwords over the wire in ASCII easily readable by anyone with a sniffer. You'll want to use CHAP, Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. It never sends the actual password over the wire, but uses a challenge handshake process as the name implies. Typically, you'll use CHAP because we love security, right? And finally, the last step in session establishment is the network layer protocol phase. What network layer protocol will be used by the session and how will it be configured? NCP packets are sent to negotiate the necessary settings. So if IP is chosen, for instance, 
Once it's configured, we're done, and network layer datagrams can now be sent over the established session. So three steps. Establish the link, optionally authenticate, and negotiate the network layer, and the PPP session is complete. Well, thanks so much, Mike. Let's go ahead and take a look at exactly how we would do this PPP configuration and that nice CHAP authentication that you alluded to. Let's go ahead and take a look. Here on R5, we're going to go ahead and first create a username and password entry. Now the username you go ahead and set to the host name of the device that you want to authenticate and you put in a password that is going to be a shared secret. You're going to go ahead and configure this exact same password on both of the devices in order for this authentication to work. Now we go in under the appropriate interface and we say, well, we need an IP address for communication certainly. So I give an IP, and then I say the encapsulation that we're going to use is PPP, and we want to engage in PPP's authentication CHAP capability. Notice this is actually crashing the interface down, and that's because we're asking to do CHAP authentication over here, and we haven't properly set up the R6 device. But we'll end our configuration there, and now we'll go over to the R6 device to complete it. Over on the R6 device, we need to create the appropriate username and password entry. The R5 is our opposing device. The password is that shared secret of Cisco. Once we do this, we can go in under the interface and configure it with an appropriate IP address. and state that we want to use PPP encapsulation. At this point, the circuit should come up, and it does. The reason being, we have encapsulation set to PPP on each circuit, and we're having the R5 device authenticate the R6 device, and we have the correct username and password entries on the devices. If we wanted to, we could say PPP authentication chap on this device, and now we're having R6 authenticate R5 as well. So we have two-way authentication here demonstrated with the chap protocol. The ultimate verification, of course, would be to ping your R5 device from your R6 device and we see that it works great. By the way, one last look at the overall configuration shows us one command was inserted by Cisco that we didn't do. Yeah, Cisco took care of one command for us, and it's the clock rate command. This is a bit of a confusing command for students in that it would not be needed in the real world when you're setting up your circuit with your service provider because the service provider would set the speed of the link or the clock rate. Here, we have to set it, Cisco set it for us automatically, because we are simulating the presence of an internet service provider. We have our routers cabled in what we call a back-to-back -back configuration to test wide area networking, and as a result, we have to provide the clock rate in order for that circuit to function.